Today is the third Sunday in Advent. We're getting ready for the birth of Jesus. And to do this, we're looking at some passages from the Old Testament and the New Testament side by side in each of these sermons. Particularly, we're looking at things that Isaiah said, whether they were statements, uh, promises, or questions for God. And then we're looking at passages from the Gospel of John that show Jesus saying something that relates to what Isaiah was talking about. Now, Isaiah lived, just for context, about 500 years before Jesus, over 500 years, actually. So we're looking at these side by side to try and understand why Jesus came as a person and, and what he was trying to accomplish. So one of the things that will be highlighted throughout this series, in all four of these sermons, is that the birth of Jesus was his first step towards the cross. And the cross is God's answer, or God's solution, to our biggest dilemma, and that is sin and the effects of sin on life. So that's where we're beginning today. We're looking at Isaiah, who made an announcement that someone was coming to do some amazing things, and this person would be from the family of David. Out of the stump of David's family will grow a shoot. Yes, a new branch bearing fruit from the old root. And the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. By the time Isaiah lived, hundreds of years after David and in, in the, the pinnacle of the kingdom of Israel, by the time that that Isaiah lived, the country was in chaos, and the royal family was a mess. So when Isaiah announces that out of the stump of Jesse's family, or you might know it from a more literal translation that other translations use, out of the stump of Jesse. Jesse is David's father. Out of the stump of David's family, out of the stump of Jesse, out of this completely dysfunctional royal family that's running the country into the ground, a new branch, a new person would emerge who would bear fruit, is the imagery. Unlike the current king, this new person would be endorsed by God. They would get God's spirit. And because of that endorsement by God, they would make wise decisions and be a wise ruler. In fact, it says, he will delight in obeying the Lord. He will not judge by appearances nor make decisions based on hearsay. He will give justice to the poor and make fair decisions for the exploited. The, the dysfunctional leaders at the time of Isaiah made horrible decisions. You, you shouldn't even apply the word leader to them. Rulers, the rulers at the time of Isaiah. They made decisions based on personal benefit. Their motivation was their own personal gain. So they would make treaties with other countries, and they would make domestic policy decisions based on what gave them power, what helped them hold on to power, what lined their pockets with gold. The bad leaders had exploited the vulnerable people. But this new person, Isaiah, is coming. This new branch will make fair decisions and give justice. And the earth will shake at the force of his word, and one breath from his mouth will destroy the wicked. He will wear righteousness like a belt and truth like an undergarment. This new, uh, this, this new royal person, this new leader that God is sending, will not be a warrior king. He would be a king whose power comes by what he says. And this is really important, because in our broken, sin-infected state, what we normally crave is strong rulers. Uh, the, the people, they want God to use physical power to accomplish things. But if we really pay attention in the Bible, 
It's not very often that God actually does that. It's not God's normal M.O. Now, another thing, though, just aside for just a moment, is we have this passage in Isaiah, or, uh, Ephesians, famous passage in Ephesians. Here's a, a diagram of it, of, of Paul talking about this armor of God. I just want to point out, Paul isn't making stuff up here. He is taking imagery that he would have grown up with, hearing, hearing Isaiah talk about uh, this person to come who, who would be, uh, you know, wear righteousness like a belt and truth like an undergarment. So this is not something Paul made up. What he's doing is he's taking imagery he grew up with. He's taking imagery many of the people he preached to would have known. And he's expanding it uh, to use in a Christian context, this, the helmet, the breastplate, the sword, the belt, the shield, the sandals. So that's just an aside. But what we're talking about here is about this person coming who is going to do amazing things by what they say. That's what it says. It says, in that day, the wolf and the lamb will live together. The leopard will lie down with the baby goat. The calf and the yearling will be safe with the lion, and a little child will lead them all. The cow will graze near the bear. The cub and the calf will lie down together. The lion will eat hay like a cow. The baby will play safely near the hole of a cobra. Yes, a little child will put its hand in the nest of deadly snakes without harm. Please do not read this literally. If you read it literally, you miss the larger meaning of what Isaiah is saying, what God is saying through Isaiah. The imagery is that this predator-prey relationship that defines so much of life will be gone. Think about this in the context of the people who first heard Isaiah say it. Because Isaiah was a preacher, there's only later things got written down. Isaiah is preaching this to the people. 2,500 years ago, every day was a struggle to survive. Not a struggle to get by, a struggle to survive. They're not struggling to pay the bills. They're struggling to survive from one day to the next. Everyone was potentially prey to someone stronger. And Isaiah says this new person is going to come along and just remove that. He's not going to conquer the prey. He's going to make them not pray anymore. Pray as in attack and eat, not pray as in say your prayers. He's going to remove that. It won't exist anymore. Now, now think about this. Think about what life would look like if the people and the things in the world that are a threat to you and cause your life to be a struggle, if they weren't a threat to you anymore. And in fact, they were companions and partners along the way helping you. Think how different that would be. And I don't just mean other people. I think, think of our situation today. Think of the virus. What if it wasn't a threat at all to anyone, ever, no matter how vulnerable you are? Think about the political unrest. What if instead of people uh, accusing each other of things, those people were looking out for each other and helping each other? That's what Isaiah says this person's going to do. They're going to turn this predator-prey relationship into something completely different. Think about people who hear this today who live in a war zone or live in, a, in an abusive home. Isaiah is telling us and telling these people that God will not leave us in that situation forever. Nothing will hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for as the waters fill the sea, so the earth will be filled with people who know the Lord. Isaiah is saying, because these threats will no longer be threats, because they'll be removed, people will be free to focus on God and being God's people and doing God's work. Now, the situation Isaiah lived in was that Israel was under constant threat from 
larger, more powerful countries around them, the, the Assyrian Empire, the Persian Empire, the Egyptian Empire, and down the road we'll get the, the Greek Empire and then the Roman Empire, all these giant powerful countries that could squash Israel. They're right outside their borders. Sometimes they're inside their borders. Isaiah is saying, don't fear these things. They won't last. Someone is coming who will lead us out of this danger. Turn the danger into not danger. The New Testament writers universally said, this passage is about Jesus. So, this is when we transition into the Gospel of John, the 15th chapter, talking about what Jesus has to say in relation to this statement by Isaiah, that someone is coming that's going to take this predator-prey relationship and, and completely change it to be a, re a relationship of partners and equals. People who don't threaten each other, but instead look out for each other. This is during the Last Supper. Jesus is, is getting ready to go to the cross and die. And he said to his disciples, I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they'll produce more fruit. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. So last Sunday, I talked about uh, Jesus saying, I am the gate, I am the good shepherd, all these I am statements. Now we have, I am the true grapevine. Jesus is painting a picture. Uh, it's a word picture for us to help us understand more fully who he is and what he is doing. And here he is saying that he is this, this branch, this, this vine, this bridge between us and God. He's what, what keeps us connected. He's also telling his disciples not to be worried about being separated from him. This is really important because they're about to experience the ultimate separation when Jesus dies. And he's getting them ready for that separation. And so he says to them, remain in me and I'll remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. You're going to be separated, he's telling them. But if you remain in me, not even death can separate us. And if you remain in me, you will produce fruit. You will live as my people. You will continue my work that I've been doing in the world. Yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. This was one of the first Bible verses I ever learned. Had nothing to do with Sunday school or confirmation or anything else. Had a very practical reason. It's because my dad was the pastor of a large church, and this was on his business card. My entire life, no matter what my dad was doing, whatever business card he had, this is the verse that was on it. And in fact, when he passed away recently, uh, I, I preached at his sermon, and this is the passage I preached on. And afterwards, my siblings wanted to make sure that I got this, that my dad, even in his retirement, he kept this in his office, reminding him, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me and I in you, the same bringeth forth much fruit. So that's what Jesus is saying. We're going to be separated by death, but remain in me. Yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. Now, Jesus isn't saying that he's going to throw people away. The implication is that when someone becomes separated from Jesus, their lives stop being beneficial to other people. They stop doing the work of Jesus. 
It's not Jesus or God that's throwing the people into the fire. It's the natural consequences of what happens to a life that becomes focused on all those dangers that threaten them and not on Jesus and doing his work and being of a benefit to other people. But, Jesus says, but if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it'll be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. This is over and over again. He's going to, God, he's going to die. They're going to be separated. But he says, remain, remain, remain. Okay, so we started with Isaiah talking to people who lived in daily fear that they would be attacked and destroyed. That predator-prey model. And, and, and they're, they're, there's predators out there, and they're the prey, and they're going to be attacked and militarily, politically, economically devoured. To so that person... Uh, it, it, so that's where we're at. And, and, and he told them, Isaiah told the people that God was sending someone. That person wouldn't destroy the threats, but would remove them. The, change the situation so that they weren't threats anymore. And now we find ourselves listening to Jesus talk to his disciples about the separation they're about to experience. Isaiah promised that God would remove these threats, and now we see Jesus is going to be killed by one of those threats. And the New Testament says universally this passage is about Jesus coming, and he's going to remove these threats. So what went wrong? Well, nothing. Jesus is going to remove the threat of death and the separation of death by overcoming it himself, by experiencing it himself, and coming out the other side. As Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Lord God, we give you thanks on this third Sunday of Advent, as we are now over halfway to Bethlehem, halfway to Christmas, where we will celebrate the birth of Jesus. And while a birth is such a happy occasion, we know, we know where it's leading. It's leading to the death and the pain and the humiliation of the cross. But that is a journey that Jesus willingly took up for us, and for our benefit. So we pray that we would never forget it, we would never despise it, we would never take it for granted, but rather, we would seek to live it each day, that we would be not only inspired by what he did, but be transformed through faith to be his people and to live lives that carry on his work, being of benefit to those around us. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen.